Now, this is life of a CISO, life of a chief information security officer. And there's really two core foundational skills that you must have to be a chief information security officer. You must understand business and you must understand cybersecurity. Welcome to Life of a CISO. I'm Dr. Eric Cole, your host, and we'll be taking you on a journey each week on what it takes to be a CISO and what are solutions that you can implement today if you are currently a Chief Information Security Officer or if you want to be one in the future. This is Life of a CISO. Welcome, 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 welcome. You know what time it is. It's time for Life of a CISO with yours truly, the doctor is in the house. Now this is life of a CISO, life of a chief information security officer. And there's really two core foundational skills that you must have to be a chief information security officer. You must understand business and you must understand cybersecurity. And then you merge those two to basically be a business leader that uses cybersecurity as a strategic weapon to grow and enhance the business. And I've spent many times talking about the letters, C-I-S-O. Let's start with the outer letters, chief officer. If you're a chief officer, you are responsible for the growth of the business. You're responsible for the growth of the business for both a revenue and a profitability standpoint. Now, whenever I say that, people always go, but Eric, what about nonprofits and governments? Well, the reality is they actually have budgets, right? They actually have to produce. They might not have to show a profit, right? But they still have revenue. They typically, even government agencies typically have money that comes in. It might be coming from Congress or taxpayers or others. But the reality is there's still money coming in. There's still fixed budgets there's still fixed revenue and you still have to operate within those revenue numbers and maximize what you're doing to align with the revenue goals. So I, I always use business as the backdrop, but to me, a government, a nonprofit or anything else is just a type of business. Maybe slightly different rules, slightly different tax filings, right? slightly different things they can write up. But the reality is if you're a chief officer, you're responsible for the business. You're responsible for the health of the business, the growth of the business, the stability of the business, and the delivering of the business. So the outer letters of your job title are business, business, business. And then the inner layers, information security, is all on how to use cybersecurity as a strategic weapon. Now what's interesting is I've said that I've teach it, but what I realized, I've never done a podcast on business. And I'm like, wait a second, if that's 50% of the equation, if that's the piece that most of you are weaker on, because most people that come to me are cyber folks that want to move into strategy. They're cybersecurity engineers that have done technical work for three or four or five years, and they want to move into the strategy. They want to move in to the business. And then I laugh because I spent all this time on the strategy and I realized I haven't spent a lot of time on business. So this podcast, this one's for you. Those that want the CNO, the chief officer, those that want everything to know about business and was afraid to ask, here we go. Business 101 in 27 minutes. All right, so let's start. First thing we need to understand about business is there's two types of expenses. There's capital expenses and operational expenses. Critical, critical for you to understand. A capital expense is a one-time purchase. So if you're buying a server, you're buying a piece of software, it's a capital expense. 300K, write the check for 300K, and it's done. There's not anything reoccurring or anything else. It's a one and done. Operational expense are things that are needed 
to run the operation or run the business with the main operational expense, of course, being salaries. Operational expense, or what we call headcount, is always tricky because it's not a one and done. Like if I go to the execs and say, I need 300K to buy a server, that's 300K. That's something they can line item that's a one-time expense, they can write it off. But if I come to them and say, I want to hire somebody who's making 200K a year, that's more difficult than here's why. First, a 200K salary, if you look at loaded rate, the loaded rate is probably 3 350 because they have medical benefits, vacation, health, all, all those other factors. So, so a 200K is not 200K. They're not giving you 200K. They're not even giving you 350K. What they're really saying is, we're committing to increase your budget by 350K every single year, and maybe even more because if we do raises and other factors like that. So operational expenses are very tricky. You're gonna have a hard time increasing headcount. I can go into most companies and with the right backdrop, the right discussion of threats and exposure, I can usually get you capital expense. If you need three or 400 bucks, sorry, three or 400 bucks, three or 400 K, right, could probably get that. Security is one of those areas where they're willing to spend money, they're willing to write a check, so I can always get you CapEx. However, especially in this day and age where everyone's sort of talking about potential recession, things are tighter, right? We're starting to see some indications of that. Companies do not want to raise their operational expense. They don't want to go in and say, okay, we're increasing your budget by 350K for every year. So operational expenses, much more difficult. Now, here's the problem. In cybersecurity, because the tech we're buying isn't at the point where it's complete automation. Yeah, you could argue maybe firewalls, if you get them and configure them correctly, once they're set up and configured, they'll block or allow traffic. However, somebody needs to set them up. Somebody needs to configure. Somebody needs to check the log. Somebody needs to make sure we're blocking and tracking what we should. Somebody, so there's always going to be a operational component to every security expense. And then it gets even worse when we get into detection. So when we get into detection technology, now they're going in and setting off alerts. If you don't have people that are monitoring and responding to those alerts, that capital expense is pretty much useless. So the problem we run into is if we go in as a CISO and understand why breaches happen. In most cases, if we're just honest, most, not all, right? it varies in a lot. This is not an across the board, but, but in some cases, what happens is a breach occurred because alerts were being generated and there wasn't enough people to respond to the alerts. So I've worked on some incidents where these vendors go, oh, we detected the attack. We detected the attack. Company failed to respond. Here's the problem. A lot of these companies today are over tuning their alerts. So they're generating a ton of false alarms. So yes, you buy this tech and it's generating 30,000 alerts a day. And in those are a bunch of garbage, a bunch of noise. And yes, the attack is in there. So yes, at some level, Mr. or Mrs. Vendor you can say you detected the attack. The reality is, unless the company has 100 people in their security operations center, which nobody does, it's pretty much useless. So it's not really detecting. But that's the issue we have. The analogy I give, it would be like if you live in an apartment building, and I go to you and I say, I will guarantee 
be able to detect when you're being robbed. Great, we hire you. And I sit outside your building. Every time somebody comes into the building, I text you. Could be a robber. Could be a robber. Could be a robber. Could be a robber. Now question, if I do that, am I technically fulfilling on my contract? That I'm guaranteeing I will detect a robber? Yes. Does it have any value to you? Nope. It's useless. Useless. Because... If I call everything an attack, right, then it doesn't have value anymore. And that's the challenge we're having. So what happens is we get some of this tech in there that's not tuned and configured correctly, and we don't have enough operational people to handle it. So just some basic numbers. Your current team, your current operational expense team, can handle 200 alerts a day. But all your tech is generating 20,000. So you're getting 20,000 alerts a day from your capital expense, but your operational expense can only handle 200. So in essence, you're missing 1,800 a day, 3,600 in two days, and it grows very quickly from there. So the probability of you detecting that attack is pretty slim. But now here's what happens. After a breach, After a breach happens, assuming you didn't get fired, assuming you still have a job, what almost always happens? The execs will write you a check. How much do you want? And this is when inexperienced CISOs that don't understand CapEx and OpEx get into a lot of trouble. Because they'll come back and be like, $2 million. Great. Now, at some level, it's sort of blood money. Because the execs want to avoid them being liable. So they want to avoid a scenario where there was a breach and then they can be blamed for not properly fixing it. So if they write a big check, that shows that, hey, we're doing what we should. But here's what happens. Before the breach, you were generating 20,000 alerts and your team could only handle 200. So now they give you a check for two mil, what do you do? You buy more capital expense, and now you have three new technologies that now totality generate 40,000 alerts. But they didn't give you any operational increase. So now, instead of 20,000 alerts and you're only handling 200, now you're generating 40,000 alerts and only handling 200. So you made the problem worse. You didn't actually solve it. And this is where a lot of CISOs don't realize is money doesn't solve problems if it's not properly balanced. Let me put it another way. Capital expense very rarely helps if it doesn't come with an increase in operational expense. So what I do after a breach is I go say, listen, we need three more people. That's what we need. I don't need more tech. I need more people. Or, you're not going to give me more people, then I need to tune my tech so it only generates 200 alerts. Which means I'm missing a lot, but today you're missing everything. So wouldn't it be better to detect 200 of the highest priority than missing 18,000 of all the attacks that are happening? So you want to recognize that cybersecurity Capital expense without operation doesn't help you. It's the operational expense of the people. Now, last thing before we then move on to profit and revenue. Capital expense is a one-time purchase. It's a one and done. But where you have to recognize for, for, uh, for purposes of what your budget is, is there's something called amortizing. You can amortize something over multiple years. So now what'll happen is you can buy something for 500K, but it only impacts 100K of your budget because the useful life of it is five years. So now instead of taking it 500K in year one and zero in year two, You could take 100 in year one, 100 in year two, 100 in year three. So there's actually ways 
that you can go in and essentially increase your budget. My budget might only be $1 million, but I can go and spend $5 million because it'll then be written off over the next five years. But check out what happens though. And this is when you take over for another CISO, you gotta be so careful. I see this all the time where they come in and go, Eric, my budget is $5 million, but I don't have any usable capital because the previous CISO spent it all over five-year amortization. So for example, if your previous CISO spent $25 million two years ago, and they did $5 million over the next five years, guess what? For the next five years, your $5 million budget has no room for growth. So you can't get anything new, buy anything new, or do anything new. So this is where capital expenses still have to be careful and work with the accounting and finance teams because just because you have the budget doesn't mean there's free revenue for you to spend if somebody went in and amortized something over a multi-year period, your previous successor might have sort of put you a little bit in a corner. So just be careful of that. Be careful of capital operational and understand the differences in how they work together. Now we get into, okay, what is a business? A business essentially, to be called a business, has to have three things. Now I'll tell you, there are lots of people out there that call themselves businesses and to me are not technically a business. So let me explain. To be a business, three things have to be in place. You have to make a profit. You have to be able to run the business without you. And you have to have a sellable asset. So there's many companies out there, even some bigger ones that aren't technically businesses. I laugh because I see some of these startups. There's someone out there now that claims he has a billion dollar business and he's a billionaire. I'm like, dude, you drive a Honda and you live in a 300K house. Now, yeah, maybe, I know Warren Buffett stays in his house and not, not everyone's into that stuff, but you're not really screaming billionaire. And then I start digging into it. It turns out, for the last three years, they've made no money. They're still losing money. But they went and got investments. So they got 75 million, then they got second round 50 million, then they got a third round 50 million. So they got almost 200, or I guess 175 million of investment that they're using to try to grow the business. But for three years, they haven't made a penny. They're losing money. The amount of money, if you take the investment away, the amount of money that they're bringing in every month is less than what they're spending. But because they were given 175 million, you can get away with it for a little period of time. That's not a business, that's an investment. Until you can self-sustain, until your revenue exceeds your expenses, you're not technically a business. And then I laugh because with all the investments, he owns less than 10% of the company. So I'm like, even if it did sell for a billion, you're not, getting, you're not walking away with a billion. So, so people always love to do these numbers, which comes to the second part of business. Profitability is what matters, not revenue. People love to look at revenue, use revenue, and use revenue as sort of these net worth. But the reality is, what are you bringing home? Once again, I see these folks out there, they're like, oh, I'm worth 100 mil. And I'm like, really? Because you're not acting, behaving, or living like that. And then you get into it, and it turns out, yes, their company makes 100 million in revenue. But to run that business, there are $80 million worth of expenses. So there's 20 million left. There's investors. There's 10 different owners of the company. 
And when all is said and done, the individual makes about 400K a year. So now, are you really worth 100 million? No, you're worth 400K. So you can play the game. You want to play the ego game that a lot of these people play and throw revenue numbers around. It's fine. But if you want to really think, act, and behave like a business person, focus on what the profitability is. That's what counts at the end of the day. So just give you an example. You go to most people. Which would you rather? Have a hundred million dollar business or a 10 million? People that don't understand business always go 100 million, 100 million. But let me give you some insight. What if that 100 million dollar business only makes 5 million profit a year and you only get 1 million? What if the 10 million dollar business is on 60% margins and you're 100% owner? So you make 6 million. Which one do you want now? Right? Do you want to make a million a year or six million a year? So the, the revenue is not really the primary driver in a business. It's the profit. What is left after expenses? What is left that goes in your pocket? What is left that goes in the shareholder's pocket? And same thing. If you're working for a huge publicly traded company, what you want to focus on is what are you giving back to the shareholders? Because you can have a billion dollar company, but if you're not making any profit and the shareholders are not making any money, they're not happy. And you could be a business owner and make $100 million, but if you're not making any money that you're bringing home, you're not gonna be happy either. So what we really wanna focus on is, what are your revenue numbers? If you talk to me, if you work with me, when I coach my clients, that's all I wanna talk about. Tell me what your profit is. Sorry, I think I said revenue there. I, all I want to care about is profitability. I don't really care about revenue. Re revenue is secondary to me. I want to know two things. The most important things to me are profitability and can you make that profit without you? Right, that, that second piece of the business. Because we have some folks that just have very well-paid jobs. If you're doing work for clients, which is time for money, which means when you show up, you get paid. When you don't show up, you don't get paid. Now, you could do very well. I know people that are very, very well-versed in their field. They get three or $4,000 an hour. I right? get 40, 50K a day for their services. They're doing very well. You get 50K a day. You work a uh, solid number of days, you're, you could be a seven, eight figure business. And it's pretty much all profitability because you really have no expenses. So yeah, you're, you're bringing home seven, eight mil a year. That's great. The problem is not really business because as soon as you stop working, the money stops. So if you're sleeping, you're not making money. If you're on vacation, you're not making money. All right, so it's not a business, it's just a high paid job. So you want to make sure you're making money when you're not working. The business can run without you. And of course, the third one is sellable asset. Yeah, it's great that I'm making 50K a day. It's great that I'm making seven, eight million in profit take home a year. But there's nothing to sell. Nobody's going to buy Eric. Nobody's going to buy Eric's brain, right? They want to buy something that's sustainable, something that can continue to generate profitability without you, which means the second most important number to me is what is the valuation? So once again, which would you rather sell a hundred million dollar company or 10 million? Now, most people, oh, this is easy, Eric, because we're selling it. So, of course, 100 million. But what is the valuation? Which means, what's the multiplier? What if you have a $100 million company that has a 1x valuation? That means your revenue is 100 million and you sell for 100 million. 
what if I have a $30 million company, but because I have so much reoccurring revenue, intellectual property value and others, the valuation is 10x. So now my 300 mil company sells for 300 million. Which would you rather, 100 mil or 30 mil? All right, so the second most important thing is, what is the value of your business? Because running a business and starting a business, you make money. If you want what we call FU money, like G6 money, billionaire money, that comes from an exit. You look at Elon Musk, Bill Gates, Jeff Bezos, any of those, they made their money on the exit when their companies went public. Right? That's how you make money, on an exit, either public or selling. If you're selling, valuation is key. What is the multiplier they're going to give you? So I tend to go in, when I build and run businesses, I tend to have lower revenue, but much higher profitability and much higher valuation. So I'm going to build a business where I'm going to capture a lot of intellectual property, have a lot of patents and know-how and built in. Then subscription, multi-year revenue, which means when they're buying you, that revenue is guaranteed for the next four years because you have four-year subscription or five-year subscription where people have prepaid for those subscriptions. So now you're, you have a much higher valuation because you now have your reoccurring revenue as opposed to a one-and-done sale. Right? This is one I'm working with one of my friends right now where he wants to sell a single product for 5K. And I'm like, dude, sell a subscription for $500 a month. He's like, no, man, I want the money. I'm like, but dude, you're struggling every month because right now sitting here today in March, you have zero revenue for April. So you now have to go in and sell 100 seats to make the number for April. And then... May, you're starting over again at zero, so I have to sell another 100 seats. But what if in March you're selling 100 seats, but it's a two-year subscription? So now, going into April, you already have a certain amount. And now April, you sell those seats, and that now is another 24 months. So now, in six months, because it keeps adding to each month, you're going into your next month with 70% or 80% of your number already met. And now, as you keep adding, now that's how you get growth, is by subscription. So yes, getting a bigger check seems nice, but having multi-year reoccurring revenue is much nicer, not only for stability, where you're not starting from zero every single month, but from an evaluation standpoint, a company with three years of subscription is probably going to be 4 to 5x. And a company that's month by month, one lump sum, is probably 1x. So those are other factors you want to keep. So first thing is understanding the difference between capital and operational. Then remembering a real business makes a profit, can run without you, and is a sellable asset. And then as you're running, managing, and building businesses, you're focused first on profit, second on valuation, and then a distance third, you're looking at revenue. Revenue can be the biggest misleader on the planet. Like I said, I've seen people that, oh, 100 million, billion, and you laugh because it's not real. Show me what the profitability is and show me what the valuation is. Then we'll talk. Then we'll evaluate, and then we'll come up with a plan of action. But don't tell me you have a billion-dollar business in which you're operating in the red, you're losing money so you don't even have profit, and you have no valuation other than a fake valuation from the investors. Because the reality is, just because companies, when they went in and gave you $50 million as investment, evaluate it to determine what percents 
valuation for investment is much different than valuation for purchasing. Because they're going to look at, once again, the intellectual property, the reoccurring, and all those other factors. So if you want to be wildly successful, focus on profit, then valuation, and then finally revenue. And then you're going to be going in and having a real business that when you sell, you're going to make that big payday. So the only decision we have to make is who's G6 are we flying in this weekend? Hope you enjoyed this episode of Life of a CISO. We'll catch you next week.